time, I will mention some of the other factors besides intermodulation and noise that must be considered in placing equipment at a crowded radio site. All transmitters radiate a spectrum of noise surrounding the carrier, and this spectrum of noise extends out several megahertz away from the carrier. If it falls on a receiver frequency in use at the site, it could be enough to cover or capture the desired signal to this receiver. Transmitter noise is generated in the first few stages of the transmitter and is amplified in the following stages along with the desired carrier frequency. The final amplifier may be a source of noise several megahertz away from the carrier. So to ensure interference-free operation at a site, it is necessary to know the level of the noise generated by a transmitter. It's difficult to measure transmitter noise in the field since it does require some special equipment. Normally the noise level measurements are made by the equipment manufacturer. And it may not be specified in the manufacturer's catalog information, uh, and when it is, generally it only considers the noise level at the adjacent channel, 12.5 or 25 kilohertz away. Transmitter noise normally decreases away from the transmitter carrier, and we need to know the transmitter noise level at all normal frequency spacings. It's not a consideration on different frequency bands, that is between 150 and 450 megahertz. A chart or graph of transmitter noise versus frequency spacing is normally available at Motorola Systems Engineering offices. Different transmitter designs have different noise characteristics, so it's necessary to know the model of the transmitter that you're considering. Transmitter noise is normally expressed in dB below the transmitter carrier power, sometimes abbreviated dBc. And it's useful for comparing performance of uh, equipment, but we do require another factor for systems design. In designing a base station site with several stations, we would like to know what radio propagation loss between transmitting and receiving antennas is required to attenuate this transmitter noise to some value that will not interfere with the receiver. This propagation loss, termed uh, isolation, can be calculated from the noise curve of the transmitter. The way to do this is to choose some low value of noise that can be tolerated at the receiver. The 12 dB SYNAD sensitivity of many receivers is about 0.35 microvolts. If we space the antennas so that 0.35 microvolts of transmitter noise appears at the receiver, the sensitivity will be degraded about 3 dB. This amount of sensitivity change can often be tolerated. It's convenient to convert all power levels to decibels relative to one watt, or dBW. This is simply 10 times the logarithm of the ratio of the power being considered to one watt. So a 100 watt transmitter would be 10 times the log of 100 divided by one watt, which comes out, as you see here, to be plus 20 dBW. To convert a receiver sensitivity to dBW, it is necessary to convert the microvolts to power in watts. Well, E squared divided by the usual 50 ohms impedance will do this conversion. So 10 times the log of this, uh, as you see, is minus 146 dBW. 0.35 microvolts equals minus 146 dBW. Our objective is to attenuate our transmitter noise to this level. Transmitters don't radiate their noise at their full power output level. It's generally considerably less. To find out how much less, it's necessary to consult a transmitter noise graph, such as this one. And it'll have to agree with the transmitter model being considered. This is a plot of transmitter noise level, usually measured over a 10 kilohertz bandwidth, versus frequency separation from the carrier. As you see, further away from the carrier, the noise level is lower. Let's take an example. Suppose we're considering a receiver frequency one megahertz away from a transmitter. And the graph here shows that the transmitter noise is 115 dB below the carrier power at this one megahertz. If we have a carrier power of 100 watts, or plus 20 dBW, then the noise is 115 dB below this, or minus 95 dBW. This is the noise level at the transmitter output. We must now reduce this noise to our receiver sensitivity of 0.35 microvolts, or minus 146 dBW. 
The isolation needed between the transmitter and receiver antennas is the difference between the minus 95 dBW transmitter noise output and the minus 146 dBW receiver sensitivity. So we must design to have 51 dB of loss or 51 dB of isolation between the transmitter and receiver terminals. This might be done by spacing the transmitter and receiving antennas so that the radio propagation loss between them equals 51 dB. Charts and graphs are available from some antenna manufacturers' catalogs that give the dB loss versus horizontal or vertical antenna spacing. With the 51 dB loss required, the antenna chart predicts a uh, vertical or tip-to-bottom spacing of about 10 feet or 3 meters for the 450 megahertz band, or horizontal spacing of 80 feet or 24 meters will also provide 51 dB isolation in the 450 megahertz band. Quite often, the necessary antenna spacing is not available on the tower or building that you might be using. Antenna spacing requirements can be reduced, however, by filtering the noise at the transmitter. And the usual means to do this is to use a resonant cavity filter. A bandpass cavity is tuned to pass the transmitter's carrier frequency, but its filtering action will reduce the transmitter noise level away from the carrier frequency. And this can be taken into account by looking at the cavity manufacturer's curve. The attenuation or the loss to the transmitter noise depends on the characteristics of the cavity and how far away from the tuned frequency you're considering. As an example, consider this bandpass cavity filter on a transmitter where we're trying to protect a receiver frequency one megahertz away. Referring to this cavity curve, we find that at uh, one megahertz, uh, we can expect an attenuation of 13 dB from this cavity. So recall in our previous calculation for transmitter noise isolation, uh, we called for 51 dB of isolation between transmitter and receiver. If we connect this cavity to the transmitting antenna line, it will cause a loss of 13 dB to the transmitter noise. Now with 13 dB less transmitter noise at 1 MHz spacing, uh, now the antenna isolation can be 13 dB less. So instead of the 51 dB antenna isolation as we had before, with the help of this cavity, we now need 51 minus 13 or 38 dB. A new antenna spacing can be predicted from the antenna chart here. 38 dB isolation can be obtained by a vertical spacing of 4 feet or 1.2 meters at 450 megahertz. The same isolation could also be obtained with 20 feet or 6.1 meters horizontal separation of dipole antennas. If these spacings are still not suitable, a second cavity can be added to the transmitter antenna line which will reduce the transmitter noise by an additional 13 dB, and this would reduce the required isolation by another 13 dB, and the result of uh, 25 dB of isolation would allow much closer antenna spacing. So that's how it can be done. A combination of antenna spacing and filtering can reduce the transmitter noise at the receiver to an acceptable level. Another type of cavity filter that can be used for transmitter noise reduction is the band stop type filter, often called a notch cavity. And they have a characteristic like this. The band stop filter attenuates one narrow band of transmitter noise. Uh, if the filter is tuned to the receiver frequency and placed on the transmitter antenna line, uh, it will reduce the transmitter noise on the receiver's frequency. One disadvantage is that they won't attenuate the noise at any other frequency. So if there are many frequencies, many receiver frequencies on this site, the band stop filter can only protect a small number of them. The band pass cavity filter will be able to protect many receiver frequencies at a crowded radio site and is normally recommended when filtering is required. The band pass cavity will protect many other frequencies that might be added in the future. In duplexer units, where the transmitter and receiver are sharing the same antenna, all of the required isolation must be obtained with the cavity filters here. There's no antenna spacing to help. Now, these duplexer units will be discussed in our next program.
After the transmitter noise is considered, the next item is receiver desensitizing. Receiver desensitizing is an effect of the receiver. And in Europe, by the way, it's called blocking. The RF power of a nearby transmitter coming into the receiver circuits will cause the receiver performance to change. Desensitizing can be the result even when the interfering signal is several megahertz away from the receiver frequency. So uh, we must consider all of this in crowded site design. The interfering signal won't be heard in the receiver audio, but uh, what will happen is desired signals may come, become very noisy and could disappear entirely when this interference occurs. The amount of off-frequency signal that can cause desensitizing depends on the design of the receiver. The Electronic Industries Association of the USA has a measurement procedure that provides a number that describes the protection that the receiver has against desensitizing. Essentially, this EIA tests tells how much signal strength above the receiver's sensitivity the receiver will tolerate without serious desensitizing. And it's expressed as decibels above the receiver's sensitivity. For example, if a manufacturer says that uh, his EIA receiver desensitizing protection is 100 dB, it means that 100 dB above the receiver sensitivity is a signal level which will begin to desensitize the receiver. If the signal level is known, then it's possible to design an installation to avoid serious desensitizing. The way to avoid desensitizing is to minimize the amount of undesired signal into the receiver circuitry. And this can be done by spacing the transmitter and receiving antennas, or by using filters uh, on the receiver to attenuate the undesired signal, or it might be done by a combination of both antenna spacing and filtering. To determine the amount of antenna spacing or filtering required, the dB isolation must be calculated. And this can easily be done using the EIA desensitizing information. The desensitizing protection figure uh, given in the manufacturer's specification is normally considering only signals on the adjacent channel. So the desensitizing protection of a receiver varies, however. Uh, it depends on how far away in frequency the undesired signal is. Generally, the further away the undesired signal, the higher the receiver protection you have. Engineering groups normally plot a curve of desensitizing protection versus frequency separation from the undesired. It may not be published, but systems engineering offices will normally have a copy. Let's take an example of how we can calculate the necessary isolation from the receiver desensitizing. Recall that the EIA desensitizing protection is the number of dB above the receiver sensitivity that causes an undesired signal, that undesired signal rather, uh, can be causing only minor desensitizing. Suppose we have a 100 watt transmitter operating 1 megahertz away from our receiver frequency. Since desensitizing protection varies with different receiver models, we must locate the graph corresponding to the receiver model and the frequency band being used. This graph here, as you see, says that 1 megahertz separation from the undesired, uh, the receiver has 120 dB of desensitizing protection. The receiver synad sensitivity is normally 0.35 microvolts, or minus 146 dB below 1 watt, minus 146 dBW, and 120 dB above a minus 146 dBW is a power level, as you see here, of minus 26 dBW. This level of power into the receiver antenna terminal will begin to desensitize the receiver. So to avoid a problem, we must somehow reduce the 100 watt transmitter power down to this minus 26 dBW level at the receiver. And the number of dB necessary to do this is simply the dB difference between plus 20 and the minus 26 dBW power level. And you find that that is 46 dB. If we position the transmitting and receiving antennas so there was 46 dB of propagation loss between them, we would accomplish our objective. It's possible to look up on our antenna spacing chart and find out how many meters of horizontal or vertical spacing would be necessary to provide this 46 dB. And it appears that uh, approximately 3 meters vertical separation or 12 meters of uh, horizontal separation would be provide the necessary 46 dB 
in the 450 megahertz band. As mentioned before, it's possible to reduce the antenna spacing by applying a filter, usually a resonant cavity filter, to the receiver antenna line. Anything that passes the desired signal but reduces the undesired signal in the receiver will help reduce desensitizing. If we place a bandpass cavity in the receiver antenna line, we'll tune it to pass the desired receiver frequency. And the cavity will attenuate the undesired signal or signals that are on these other frequencies. As an example, consider our example again where a transmitter at the site was one megahertz away from our receiver frequency. Referring to the cavity performance curve, we see that the cavity will attenuate a signal one megahertz away by 13 dB. We previously saw that 46 dB isolation from the transmitter was required to prevent desensitizing. With the cavity reducing the undesired signal by 13 dB, we can now reduce our antenna spacing requirements by that 13 dB, which comes out to 33 dB. So 46 dB of isolation is still required, but uh, the 33 dB can be obtained by antenna spacing, and 13 dB can be obtained from the cavity filter. So a new antenna separation can be read off the spacing chart for 33 dB. We must consider transmitter noise as well as receiver desensitizing in site design. Recall earlier we calculated that uh, 51 dB isolation was necessary to protect against transmitter noise. If we space the transmit and receive antennas to obtain 51 dB, we would have more than enough isolation to prevent desensitizing, which required only 46 dB in our example. These effects are considered separately. Now, fortunately, they don't add. When reducing the antenna spacing by the addition of cavities to the transmitter or receiver, be sure to check both noise and desensitizing to make certain that both noise and desensitizing requirements are satisfied by this revised spacing. Both the transmitter noise and receiver desensitizing calculation uh, done here assume that some change in receiver sensitivity can be tolerated. And normally, uh, from these figures, it's 3 dB degradation of the synad sensitivity that uh, is considered. If this is unacceptable, then increase the isolation required between antennas by 10 dB for both noise and desensitizing effects. And this will result in only one half dB of sensitivity change of the receiver. There's much more to site design, such as duplexers and combiners of various types but these subjects will be discussed in a separate program. So this concludes our presentation of transmitter noise and receiver desensitizing.